RTL Ad Connect is the advertising sales house of RTL Group, a leading company in broadcast, digital and content production. We provide international brands with premium and brand safe advertising environments across all platforms. As a leading broadcaster in Europe, we have three responsibilities, to inform, to entertain, and to engage. Indeed, we believe it is our duty to educate and inform our audiences on societal and environmental issues. We produce qualitative and reliable content with verified information. We strongly believe in transparency, in legitimacy, and professional journalistic work. Secondly, we have the responsibility to uh, entertain our audience, to inspire them, to comfort them, to make them smile and laugh, hopefully, which is extremely important in those pandemic times. And lastly, we want to engage with our audience. We want to gather them around powerful formats. We want to give them a choice, to give them a voice, and we want to give them the full picture of any uh, topics or any information. The advertising industry, including broadcasters and publishers, has a responsibility to give a voice to brands working for a better future, because these brands can make a difference. Brands need effective ways to reach their audience and their consumers. So it is our role at RTL at Connect to bring them safe and transparent platform and try to create the right connection between consumers and brands. Europe is a very complex and fragmented market with different habits and media consumptions. At RTL at Connect, we have the insider knowledge and we provide a unique and simplified access to European consumers via sets of TV and radio stations, but also digital platforms. And those platforms are committed to delivering high quality and brand safe content, but also delivering effectiveness measurable across all streams. This is how we connect the dots between brands, consumers and content and how we can guarantee sustainable brand growth. In the fight against climate change and social inequalities, many questions still arise for industry. What is our social responsibility? How can we implement best practices around the world? How can we reduce our carbon footprint? Solutions are starting to emerge. For example, the usage of a carbon calculator for content production or a new initiatives around reducing the energy consumption for streaming or BVOD platform. There is still so much to be done and we all have a part to play. Together, we can work for a better society, a better planet and ultimately a better growth. Let's now move to the last session of our conference. I like to think we've saved the best for last. We have the pleasure to welcome the legendary Mark Ritson. Mark is kind of a celebrity in our industry. He probably doesn't need an introduction, but for the sake of it, I'll do it anyway. Mark has been a columnist for Marketing Week for over a decade. He's a consultant to some of the world's greatest brands, and is also a marketing professor. He's taught on the MBA programs of the top business schools and has launched his widely acclaimed mini MBA program. He's outspoken and thought provoking and has a particular appetite for calling out the hype our industry sometimes falls prey to. Exactly what we welcome at WFA and the perfect way to conclude our conference. So welcome Mark and thank you much for joining us. Thanks, Stefan, and um, it's a great honor not only to uh, to be part of the of, of the event this week, but also to close out everything and finish hopefully in style. So my title uh, for my session is Growth and Peril in Purpose. Um, and this was a title we agreed many months ago um, over a glass of red wine, um, and uh, things have changed a lot since. So let me let me just update it slightly. Um, when I was growing up in England, uh, one of the most famous articles uh, each week was A Life in the Day, which came out in the Sunday Times on a Sunday, and they'd interview somebody famous about a typical day and try and show what kind of person they were. Recently, two relatively similar uh, British actors have been featured in A Life in the Day. 
Uh, one of them was uh, the, the wonderful and, and fragrant Orlando Bloom over my shoulder uh, here. Uh, and the other one is the um, uh, equally well-known, um, but perhaps slightly less famous, at least internationally, the wonderful and exceptional Tom Hollander. Um, both good, good actors, both relatively famous, but when you actually read their Life in the Day columns, what emerges is a dramatically different picture of these two human beings. I, I'm gonna circulate, and you can find this online pretty easily as well. I'm gonna circulate both of these columns. Um, they're fantastically interesting for different reasons, but I'll just give you an opening excerpt and you'll get a flavor of what's going on. So let's start with, with, um, with Tom Hollander um, and his uh, opening section of his, uh, of his life in the day. He says, I wake up generally at 3 or 4 a.m., not because I'm like Margaret Thatcher, but because I need to pee. I pee in the darkness, using my phone screen to illuminate the target. Then, often take half a sleeping pill, an antihistamine, turn on the world service very quietly, and try to go to sleep again. Sometime between 6 and 8, I wake again, turn up the Today program gently. If my girlfriend is there, we hold each other in different positions. If she isn't, I wrap my arms around a pillow and continue listening to the bad news. It's a kind of grumpy, beautiful, middle-aged, very British way of life. Now, in contrast, Orlando Bloom's account of his typical day was so ridiculous, many people actually thought it was a pastiche. It wasn't, he was being serious. Here's Orlando's opening paragraph of how he starts his day. Bloom says, I like to earn my breakfast, so I'll just have some green powders that I mix with brain octane oil, a collagen powder for my hair and nails, and of course, some protein. It's all quite LA really. Then I'll go for a hike while I listen to some Nirvana or Stone Temple Pilots. By 9 a.m. it's breakfast, which is usually porridge, a little hazelnut milk, cinnamon, vanilla paste, hazelnuts, goji berries, a vegan protein powder, and a cup of PG tips. I'm 90% plant-based, so I'll only eat a really good piece of red meat maybe once a month. I sometimes look at a cow and think, that's the most beautiful thing ever. Now, these two very different accounts brought very different interpretations. Um, Hollander's account made you feel like he was like the rest of us. Meanwhile, Orlando's account made him seem woke and entirely worthy, but not quite of this planet. Hollander really, surprisingly for a quite famous actor, seemed very much part of the real world, very much like the rest of us whereas Bloom seemed somehow divorced from reality and the real day-to-day -day lives of everyday people. Overall, Hollander strikes you as an incredibly authentic person. He tells the truth. He's kind of pathetic in an adorable way. Orlando Bloom just seems totally full of shit, according to his account. And the end result is uh, Hollander just seems likable. And in contrast, Bloom comes across as a total and utter arsehat. I'm going to put it to you in this talk that that's kind of an analogy for how things are going at the moment in the world of advertising. OK, I think, you know, those tropes we get on social media where someone says how it started and how it's going. I think we started out in advertising with a real practical uh, proletariat focus on the working men and women and what they wanted to buy. And I think we are dramatically and ridiculously mutating into a discipline in both marketing and advertising that is overly concerned with things that don't include the actual minutiae of everyday life and the importance of quotidian existence and targeting everyday consumers, how advertising works, what brands do. I think we're losing it. So I wanna change my title. And I wanna change my title to the ad industry, the Orlando bloom of the corporate world. I think we're increasingly full of shit and we're increasingly despised as a result of our dislocation from reality and our roots. Now, we have three conference themes um, for this session, for the WFA session, sustainability, diversity, and marketing as part of the solution. I, I wanna make it two things very clear because I'm gonna be quite critical in a minute. I'm not critical of the WFA. I support all of their amazing work. I think they're a fantastic organization and I'm honored to be here. 
What's more, I support all of these three themes. I applaud and support all of them, and I think they're incredibly important. And, and I'm going to say that again, because some ass at tomorrow on social media is going to say, I'm not in favor of diversity or sustainability. I applaud and support every one of these three themes. They're super important. But, big but, look at the state of our industry and look at the state of where we are right now. And it's clear that we also have to worry about some things closer to home. Ad effectiveness is in decline. I could pick one of a hundred charts to show advertising is less effective than it used to be. My current favorite, which comes out of the IPA database in the UK, again, based on hundreds and hundreds of cases across a 10 year period, shows us that the work that gets all the awards is less and less effective. So not only is advertising becoming less effective, but our ability as an industry to recognize and award proper work is beginning to dissipate and decline. Linked to that, short-termism is increasing, which is a terribly dangerous thing I'll touch on in a minute for brand building and advertising effectiveness. Internally, marketing is increasingly rife with charlatans and philistines. You know, when I grew up in marketing in the 80s, there were these great men and women whose books you could read, um, whose talks you could occasionally see, whose classes you could attend, and you could learn marketing from people who knew about marketing. Unfortunately, because of social media, the, the most, the loudest and most influential voices are very rarely those that actually have any knowledge about marketing at all anymore. And it's doing dramatic damage to the discipline. Externally, we are the least trusted people on the planet. Now, you might say, oh, fuck, Mark, you're getting carried away now. No, empirically, we're the least trusted people on the planet, yeah? You can go through the whole list recorded by Ipsos Mori of percentage of people who trust these different professions. This is UK data. And as you go down through, through horrible things like polishers, television news executives, bank robbers, politicians, they're right at the bottom, dead last, advertising executives yeah we are the least trusted people on the planet cmo influence is more tentative than ever yes our tenure is less than any other c role on the board and yes that statistic might be a bit well worn but 80 percent of ceos don't trust their cmos to be any good at marketing marketing fundamentals in my opinion are in, are in free fall i think we are less good at marketing as an industry globally than we were 20 years ago we're going backwards because the knowledge and development of the industry is frankly um uh, di diverting from central so i'd like to propose an additional conference theme as we approach the end of this week again i support these three themes but we need to focus on marketing and advertising too. We are the World Federation of Advertisers. Let's worry about advertising a little bit and marketing too. So let me take those themes, sustainability, diversity, and being part of the solution, and let me turn them back towards the topic of marketing. Let's talk about sustainability, not about the planet and with David Attenborough for a second, important as that is, but let's talk about sustainability in a marketing and advertising context. The work of Field and Burnett, the great thinking of our generation in marketing and advertising tells us a very simple picture. We all want growth. Ultimately, we want growth. Sales uplift over base. And that sales uplift takes place over time. Famously, as I'm sure you know, they chart two different trajectories towards that growth. The first, the red line of short-term activation performance marketing is a short-term investment which makes your sales go up. Ooh, and then when you take your foot off the investment pedal, straight back down to where they were before. Not a bad thing because the I involved in, in pressing the pedal gives you a much better R in terms of ROI. But there is a second trajectory, a more elongated and, and incremental trajectory in the form of brand building. It takes longer, but it is, it is a crucial second line to growth. And again, this isn't about red versus blue. It's about the long and the short of it and how these two work together. Uh, and Field and Burnett are even more generous. They've even worked out from hundreds of gay studies the perfect split between long and short. It varies by sector, but in consumer good marketing, for example, it runs at 60% long-term brand building and 40% activation. But that's not the question. The question is why in reality does almost no company get anywhere near that 60% brand building ratio? And the answer is because of sustainability, not in this case of the planet, but sustainability of marketing and advertising thinking. 
we are getting less and less long-term and more and more short-term. Data from the Financial Times, and again, the IPA, shows us that there's a small selection of companies that went into 2021 thinking that they would actually lengthen their marketing reporting cycles. But they're massively dwarfed by those companies that are getting shorter in their mindset. It, the B2B LinkedIn Institute reports that 4%, 4% of B2B marketers measure beyond six months and that 75% of them have finished optimization within the first two weeks of a campaign. B2B, B2C, we're too short term. So why are we ignoring this incredible model and the plethora of data that supports it? Well, very simply, when you look at this chart with two or three years worth of latitude, it all makes perfect sense. But most marketers don't look at the world in a sustainable long-term way. They see everything from within this stupid 12-month planning cycle. And within that 12-month or six-month cycle, you'd be certifiable to invest money in brand building. Look at the ROI you get from short-term performance marketing. It's two, three, four times more than you get from brand building. Sure it is, but ROI is a half stupid variable. It's great at measuring different short-term stuff, but it misses the sustainable long-term point. And for most companies, they just keep doing this every year, looking at dumb ROI, overspending on performance marketing, under investing in brand. And then it happens again and again and again and again. It's Groundhog Day in most organizations. We repeat, we repeat, we repeat. To quote one of the great marketing heroes of all time, Peter Drucker, who saw this thing 40 years ago, you have to produce results in the short term, but you have to produce results in the long term. And the long term is not simply the adding up of short terms. Let's turn our attention to diversity. First of all, let's point out that diversity is super important. And in marketing as an industry, we are hopeless at it. Um, this is data again from the UK showing the degree to which we are a diverse employee uh, industry. You'll see that marketing has actually the strongest cohesion, the least diversity in terms of values and beliefs, and that should be no surprise. Most people in marketing and advertising come from high eco socioeconomic backgrounds, far more prevalence of private schooling, um, and, and literally all think the same. We have very poor diversity in the marketing and advertising industries. We're, we're actually the worst of them all. But I want to apply diversity here internally again to the marketing and advertising discipline. A year or so ago, when the FEs turned 50, the organization, the FE organization, gave me an amazing invite. They asked me to look at all of the submissions for FEs over the 50 years in order to see if I could see any patterns or lessons. And it was an amazing and generous invitation. One of the things I wanted to look at is what's the optimum number of channels? that creates the most effectiveness. So over there on the y-axis, you've got an effectiveness score. And on the x-axis here, how many channels were used in more than 4,800 campaigns? And what we should see is the magic number emerging. So what did the data from almost 5,000 big advertising campaigns across 50 years tell us? This is what it told us. It's very hard to make data do that, but what you're seeing is that, an almost straight line. And what it's telling you is the more channels you add to a campaign, the more effective it is. More is more. I'm not the first person to discover this. Analy Analytic Partners, one of my favorite research firms, found something similar when they looked at five years worth of more than 3,000 campaigns in America. Many campaigns, 29%, use only one channel. But when they looked at campaigns that used two channels, whatever those channels were, around 31% of the campaigns they looked at, they saw a boost in long and short term impact of 19%. When you added a third channel, there was a 23% boost over one channel. Four channels, we got to a 31% boost. And with five channels in a campaign, we saw a 35% increase in performance over a single channel campaign even when analytic partners controlled for budgets and how much was invested. More is more. And analytic partners went further. They can show you why. There is true value in diversity when it comes to channels. Um, this is TV combined with online video. When you take a bit of your TV budget and you put it into digital video, you get on average a 35% boost in its overall impact. And when they looked at 
any two media and taking some money from the first and putting it into the second, not spending more, but spreading the money across multiple tools. What's amazing is they always saw a synergy. Diversity always wins over channel apartheid. It, diversity makes campaigns just like it makes marketing departments, just like it makes companies work better. A times B is always greater than putting all your money on A or all your money on B. But we keep missing this point. We keep talking about digital versus traditional, mm, traditional TV versus YouTube. You know what the answer is? It's fucking both, both. You want them both because together that the diversity gives you a better impact. And I feel that that message on diversity is consistent with the broader message on societal diversity, but we should learn it inside marketing. Let's end with purpose. Uh, purpose is uh, uh, an interesting uh, challenge for many, and, and it's a particular challenge for me because I've got my slides in the wrong order. Uh, what can I do here? I'm just going to talk to this quote, and then I'll, I'm just going to talk to you without my bullets for a second. Why are we so obsessed with purpose? I love this quote from the empathy delusion. The major driving force behind virtue strategies is not the needs of the mainstream. It's the assumptions and needs of the people in the advertising and marketing industry. Let's not forget, we are an elite subset of the population. Most in the mainstream remain motivated by materialism simply because they have less stuff and don't take it for granted. All of the fine and well-meaning people that get up on stages and talk about the power of purpose are all millionaires, literal millionaires. For most working men and women, they don't have those broad dreams. Their purpose is to stay in employment, to afford health insurance, to pay their rent or mortgage and to feed their kids. We are, I'm afraid, an industry that is above the consumers we serve. And another point about purpose. Um, it has to pass the three C's test. Sometimes it definitely does. Purpose is a form of positioning. And when we talk about positioning, we talk about passing three distinct tests. Is it what the customer wants? Is it something the company can deliver? And can we do it better or different from the competition? All so often we discover that purpose doesn't pa pass those tests. Sometimes customers want purpose. Very often in a piece of simplistic research, they say, yes, purpose is very important to me until we look at the drivers of what's really um, sending a purchase one way or another. On the company C, there are lots of companies claiming to be driven by purpose, but we have a wonderful test called tax, which displays most companies to be entirely purposeless when it comes to actually behaving in line with their stated promises. And then there's a the competitive C. So much of this purpose stuff sounds and looks the same, make today great, making today better. Look at what happened during COVID. We had a lineup of identikit brands all doing the same thing, all essentially looking the same with their tinkly pianos and people looking out of windows and brands feeling customers pain. I guess my challenge in all of this is sometimes purpose works, but a lot of the time it doesn't. And it's the story of these rich millionaires with a big aspiration for their brands. Brands are not big things. Brands are little, little things. And no one really cares about our brand or our purpose. And ultimately, I believe purpose more often than not takes us in the wrong direction, but it's cool and it's trending. So I believe strongly in these themes and I support them with all, all my minor influence. Yes, sustainability is, is important. Yes, diversity is incredibly important and marketing must be part of the solution. But let's also worry about the challenges of marketing too. Let's not forget that we have a, a broad societal mission, but we're not talking enough right now about the state of marketing or the state of advertising. We should get back to work and focus on that as well. Or to put it in one final statement, we need to be more Tom and less Orlando. Where at the close of their two life in the days, we saw another example of the difference between them. Orlando closes his section with, well, we put the baby to bed and then it's dinner time. And after that, I like to watch a movie or documentary for work. I aim to get to bed by 11. If I get eight hours sleep, I'm happy. And so is my sleep tracker. Time is so precious. I was always giving my time to other people before, but now, now I have space to dream. He ends as he, as he began, entirely full of shit. And yet, the wonderful Tom ends in exactly the same way as he started. It's time to go to sleep again. Cracking a little sleeping pill in half, 
In case I need it later, I turn on the radio very quietly. If my girlfriend's there, we hold each other in various shapes. And if she's not, I put my arms around a pillow. Let's be more real. Let's be more authentic. Let's be more connected to our consumers. And let's not forget the mission and humility of marketing and advertising with all these other more advanced and admirable goals. Thank you. Back to the studio in Belgium. Yes. Hello, Mark. Hello, Mark. Hello, my friend. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for joining us uh, from Tasmania today. And um, thank you for sharing with your usual candor. It's exactly what we need at the end of our three-day conference. Uh, I, I'd like to invite the audience to share questions. Uh, we have a, a little bit of time left for, for Q&A. I wanted to pick up on the, on the subject you touched upon at the beginning of your presentation around the decline of effectiveness. No? Um, we've, we've talked over the last three days about sustainability, we've talked about um, diversity inclusion, and we've talked about growth today. And the common denominator in order to be addressing those challenges successfully will be creativity. Now, we need to be doing a much better job in terms of creativity. And here's the question to you as marketing professor and, and marketing consultant, what do you think is going to be needed for us to turn this around as an industry? Uh, I think it's a, it's the key question. Uh, I think creativity is a big part of it, but there's a big long checklist of what drives effectiveness from uh, the use of distinctive assets to smarter and more uh, uh, relative and realistic positioning. And I think what we have to do is come out of the last decade, which was obsessed with media. So uh, through no one's fault, we spent a decade arguing about digital versus traditional, about you know uh, the safety of the of the digital supply train, about brand safety and so on. We became obsessed with media, and I think we missed uh, a lot of the discussion about how good the ad was. We were obsessed with the pipe, not what we were putting in the pipe or the strategy behind the pipe. So I, I hope it's a. I don't want, don't think media is unimportant, but I hope we begin to center media next to creative and next to strategy as equally important contributions to effectiveness. Because at the moment, I think we are um, sadly very far off the pace. Mark, we, we get a lot of questions here in, and uh, let me take the one which ranks um, highest right now, which is, what's the use of, make it, of um, making our marketing more effective if, if we're all burnt to a crisp cause of global warming? That's a nonsensical question, um, and I was expecting it. Um, we live in a world where everyone seems to be um, exclusively focused on one versus another. Um, it, it, I like bothism. I like the idea that you can, well, smart people at least, can do more than one thing at the same time. My point, as I try to clearly make, is not to undermine the excellent focus of these last three days. But my other point is, we should also turn a bit of that attention back towards advertising and marketing and some of its shortfalls, not because sustainability is not important. It's the most important challenge we face. But we have another um, important contribution to society, an economic one, whereby while at the same time we should be looking after the planet and making huge inroads there, we need to make sure economically we're driving the world forward. During COVID, for example, all these brands feeling customers' pain, nobody gave a shit what the brands thought about COVID. What those brands should have been doing is keeping satisfying customers, keeping their employees in work, and keeping the economy turning. And there is a case for that, not at the cost of the planet, but in harmony and, and, and both alongside the planet. So I just think we've turned our attention so much towards these uh, meter topics. We're missing some of the more myopic things that also need to be addressed. A question coming in here with respect to the 3C test. Um, have you, and what would be the sort of company which, comes to, which brand comes to mind, which has been able to define a purpose and live by purpose in a way that, that passes your 3C test? Oh, look, I'd pick two. Um, I'm, I've tried for many years to catch Unilever out, um, um, and I haven't been able to. They are the real deal. They pay their taxes, spectacularly so. Um, they walk the walk, and they believe in what they're doing, and their brands are genuinely a force for good and commercially successful. Um, I don't buy some of the small print on the on the causation between purpose and uh 
and commercial success, but I, I believe they're the real deal. And I think Unilever are an astonishingly impressive company. I'd also highlight Dole. Um, and I know um, the same I was talking earlier this in, in the week. I think Dole is one of the few examples of a purpose-based campaign that does pass the three C's test. Customers do want and should be eating more fruit. Dole can deliver on that promise and everyone else in this field is selling them shit. So I think that's a beautiful and really rather impressive brand purpose. And I, I don't just think it was a moving execution, which it was. I think strategically it ticks all the boxes and I think it will I think it's a work of great of great quality. And here's a question around um, the all-time marketing BS mark uh, and who wins that pandemic prize um, in terms of um, in terms of BS marketing uh, during the pandemic? Oh, look, there are so many. It would be unfair to select one. I'd probably, at the top of my list, they're a delightful bunch. I, I put two different companies at the top of the list. Uh, you have to put Starbucks up there because they've been talking shit for 10 years about building communities and in and their, and their mission while doing an astonishing and very legal job of minimizing tax. And I think that's a stunning example of the whole shit we often see. And I'd like to list all of the oil companies, every single one of them, because all of their ads talk about the future, talk about the sustainable stuff that's coming, talk about the potential of what's happening next. Lots of young people in lab coats. The future will be great. And all of them are doing 99% of their profits still from fossil fuels. And we need to call them out. There are good men and women working for these companies, uh, and they're too good to work for them anymore. Marketing is part of the problem in those companies. And I think every oil company now, the marketing is a real problem for us because it's obfuscating the real story of what's going on. So I'd say, yeah, any oil company and Starbucks are top of my list of BS. And closing question, Mark, um, now, despite all the failings and shortcomings of the marketing profession right now, which I think you rightfully sort of um, point out, what makes you still passionate and in a way confident about the marketing profession in the future? Well, I'm not so confident. I mean, I'll give you a capitalist answer and then a more, a more warm answer to finish. As, as a capitalist, I don't really want marketing to get better. You know, I work for clients uh, against other competitors. The fact that they've got idiots running their marketing isn't a bad thing because we can smash them. And, and from a capitalist point of view, it, you know, it's great because you're up against people who aren't that, that sharp. And, and there's nothing better than that when we're playing the game of capitalism. On a broader level, though, um, I think the thing that motivates most good marketers isn't creativity and isn't advertising and isn't money. I think it's consumers. I missed the moment or the memo where delighting and satisfying customers with good products and services made sustainably um, became not very cool and not, not satisfying enough for marketers and advertisers. The thing that turns me on is, is turning on customers. And, and that remains at the heart of, I think, most marketers' um, love for the game. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining us from Tasmania. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stefan. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this concludes our conference. I hope you enjoyed the presentations and the interactions and that you feel inspired and energized. I'd like to thank all of our outstanding speakers for making it such an inspiring event. But most of all, we'd like to thank you, WFA members and guests from over 70 countries for joining us remotely in these exceptional circumstances. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel. The vaccination is progressing and we look forward to welcoming you in person at our Global Market Week next year. And here's the scoop. Globe Market Week 2022 will take place in Athens, Greece, from April 5 to April 8, 2022, co-hosted with our friends and partners of SDE, the Hellenic Advertisers Association. Until then, stay safe and be well. We hope to see you all in Singapore later this year and in Athens next year. Thanks again and goodbye. <laughs>